1245, restate my assumptions. 1. Mathematics is the language of nature. 2. Everything around us can be represented and understood through numbers. 3. If you graph the numbers of any system, patterns emerge. Therefore, there are patterns everywhere in nature. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings from Tbilisi, Georgia. This is Byrne, the anadromist, and it's a nice overcast day. The weather has finally cooled down. It's about, I don't know, 20 degrees uh, Celsius, somewhere, I guess that's around uh, 70 something. Anyway, it feels a lot cooler than the 90 somethings and 37 degrees and 35 degrees that we had uh, not too long ago. So, I'm happy. Anyway, uh, we are going to continue our discussion on time today and the meaning of time, and more importantly, how we live in time. Now, again, you will hear uh, maybe some background noises. I just heard had a cat at the window right behind the camera who was peeking in and doing a little bit of uh, mewing. Outside, there are children playing and uh, there has been some loud uh, construction, which may continue. I, I hope I'm on their lunch break, but you never know. So if you hear all these things, welcome to Georgia. Anyway, where was I? Well, uh, we were talking about the clock, and we were talking about how time is not the clock. The clock is a measurement of time, and... Uh, that somehow having confused these things has led to the problems we have today. So that we don't live in time, we live against time. Now I'm going to start by reading a short piece by the Russian philosopher Nikolai Berdyayev from his book called The Beginning and the End. And I'll discuss that a bit more in a minute, but let me first read it for you. Newness presupposes time. It makes its appearance in time. Without time, there is no change. But time is not a form into which the world process is packed and which communicates movements to the world. Time exists because movement and newness exist. A motionless, unchanging world would have no knowledge of time. The creation of what is new presupposes that that which is created was not before, it had not been within time, and it discloses itself within time. And this means that creativeness presupposes non-being, something other than being. But time, which brings new life with it, also has a death-dealing pity. It mercilessly crowds out what was. It bestows at one and the same time the presentiment of life and death. Youth and old age are alike brought about by time. It gives rise alike to change, which is good, and to betrayal, which is evil. I shall say more later about its various meanings. The fact that the world exists in time and not only in space means that the world is not completed, that its creation has not yet reached its crowning consummation, that it continues to be created. Nikolai Berdyayev, The Beginning and the End. So that's a very interesting observation, that time is related to newness, and it's related to movement. And that's a very different definition of time than we normally get uh, through our popularized science and media. 
um, recently watched a part of a documentary series. Well, I watched the whole series, but part of it was on time uh, by Stephen Johnson, and it was uh, How We Got to Now, I think that was the name of the documentary, and he had a series on time. What was fascinating to me was the entire time he spent in the documentary, it was all about clocks and measurement of time. It was not about time. <laughs> and he did at one point kind of make a point I would have made, is that the clock changed our experience of time. No, it didn't, you know, it, 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 and that's the important thing. It's our experience of time. And as I have said before, time is not a thing. Time is personal. Now, today, what I'm going to attempt to do, and uh, you can pray for me or uh, whatever you want right now, because this is difficult stuff, but to give you a little bit of my understanding of how time got confused in science and how this is kind of at the root of many of our problems today. That there was a basic, it was not intentional, just an accidental pushing of time and the effects of time out of the picture in order to uh, create modern science as we know it today. So, Let's go back to the ancient world for a moment. And at that point, the ancient world had no particular problems with time. You may hear now the... Sounds like the construction is starting again. I'm just going to keep going because if I wait until it's perfect, it'll be too late for me to do this because then it'll be dark and the light won't be so good. So, in the ancient world, there wasn't a particular problem with time yet. Uh... There was the bad use of time in the sense of, you know, I'm sure the Roman legions had schedules which were quite grueling time-wise, but by our standards, the schedules would not be very grueling at all. You know, you show up within a day or two of a certain event, you know, if you're going to go fight, or, you know, you would have the calendar time, you would have the sundial. These are not particularly onerous as far as time goes. But um, the ancient Greeks... They did a little bit of thinking on time, some of it which would influence uh, Aristotle, who uh, would influence people like Galileo, and also Archimedes did some uh, work on time. But they lived within time in the old sense of the word, word as personal time. Uh, they hadn't yet got to the modern idea. Now, the, where does the modern idea of time start? It starts with the formulations of Renaissance perspective in the early period of the Renaissance with people like uh, Giotto and uh, Masaccio and these people who were formulating that. You, you've seen these photos of, of a line of perspective going out or, uh, towards... Uh, you know, this infinite line going back. That is Renaissance perspective. Now, Hans Ruckmacher has a very interesting quote where he says that essentially uh, the idea of space came from, that the space we know it now came from the Renaissance artistic perspective. And let me play a little bit of Ruckmacher right now talking about this. He was a, uh, an art historian he knew his art. He knew his Renaissance art. He knew the, a history of ideas. So let's listen to Hans Ruckmacher. This was about 1976, talking about uh, the relationship between Renaissance artistic space and space as we would come to know it. The new worldview. So we have had the pagan worldview, the biblical, the medieval, and now we come to the modern one. It begins with this Mondinus who began to cut into a body. It's a new visibility, this new way of looking at things, out of which also Renaissance art is coming. Because we must understand, and I'm just making big jumps, and I do it very quick, we have no time to go into it. Uh, but when Alberti and Masaccio and his friends were formulating Renaissance perspective, and therefore defining Renaissance space, 
This was something totally new that never had been in history before. And when Descartes says in the beginning of the 17th century that space is a res estensiva, the, it's the, the boundless, uh, everywhere homogeneous matter, this is how he defines space, res estensiva, the homogeneous extensive matter, then you must understand that it was, that is very new. Before the Renaissance, the space was not homogeneous. So the new formulation, which is based also on geometry and mathematics, of the new way of understanding space in the Renaissance, went on through Descartes, and from Descartes on to Kant. So when Kant says that one of our categories is space, we must understand that he's saying something very special. He's saying that one of the categories of us is space, and that is the Renaissance definition of space as was defined by Alberti and a Renaissance artist. It's that space. It's Renaissance artistic space, not any other space. So it goes into history like that. It's a new visibility with a new understanding of reality, with a new spatiality of reality, or spaciousness, or how you call that. Now, the interesting thing about the early modern scientists like Copernicus and Leeuwenhoek and Galileo and uh, Christian van Huygens and all of these people was they loved weighing and measuring things. And they had no problems with time because they all lived in it in the old sense of the word, just as in the more uh, the current day, people teaching people in the 1950s about uh, modern philosophy and existentialism and, and some of the further out ideas didn't actually live in those ideas the way people do now. They were coming out of an older perspective, so they could almost hold them out as dangling things. Well, something similar happened back then. Interestingly enough, Galileo was very curious about pendulums. And uh, he looked at them ever since he was a young boy, and eventually started formulating ideas about them, about the way they go back and forth. So much so that he eventually came up with a theory about the movement of the pendulum and how it was always equal, no matter how short the uh, distance or how long the distance. It took just as much time in the middle as it did in the outer edges, which was a very interesting uh, uh, observation. But... He took time as a basic given. He didn't really question it, nor did he try to understand it all that deeply. I'm going to read you a little bit right now out of the entry on Galileo in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And this really explains, I think in a very concise manner, Galileo and the early scientists' relationship to time. It is in this way that Galileo developed the new categories of the mechanical new science the science of matter and motion. His new categories utilized some of the basic principles of traditional mechanics, to which he added the category of time, and so emphasized acceleration. But throughout, he was working out the details about the nature of matter so that it could be understood as uniform and treated in a way that allowed for coherent discussion of the principles of motion. That a unified matter became accepted and its nature became one of the problems for a new science that followed was due to Galileo. Thereafter, matter really mattered. And that's from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So essentially, the early scientists of uh, the Western world were more concerned with matter than time. Time was important, as, but they viewed it as a way of measuring things. But matter was what really interested them, and the mechanics of things, and how things worked. So how you could weigh and measure, and other, in other words, take things in by your senses, uh, that was important to people. And they could just put time kind of over there. Interestingly enough, Galileo came up with an idea about primary and secondary qualities. This was based on some older Greek ideas, but he is certainly put his own spin on things, and he was trying to uh, redefine things Aristotle had done. Now, 
I, you know, disclaimer again, I'm no scientist, I'm no philosopher, but these are things that I've uh, come across in my reading. And primary qualities, as he defined it, were considered to be properties of objects that were independent of the observer. So, uh, he would put things like solidity, what we might call mass, uh, extension, which would be another property of mass, uh, motion, which would not be a property of mass, number and figure. He put all of these in the, these are all just exist apart from anybody doing anything about them. Primary qualities. Secondary qualities would be considered to be properties that produce sensations in the observer. Uh, these are a bit more subjective. So, for instance, color, taste, smell, sound. Because obviously, we all look at things differently. And, for instance, just uh, your eyes and such, everyone interprets colors and sounds and smells and tastes a little bit differently. Uh, also, they are dependent, for instance, uh, every object is dependent on how the light strikes it and how the configuration of uh, chemical elements within it uh, reflects that sun. So, he put all of these things in this kind of secondary quality of, in other words, they weren't quite as real as the primary qualities. Which then gets into a problem. What makes you so sure that the primary qualities are all that real? For instance, the, the weight, the mass, the, uh, the extension, uh, these kinds of things. What makes you think those things are quite so real? Over time, more and more of these properties would be put over into the secondary qualities. And the only one left on the other side in primary qualities would be numbers. And that's kind of funny because numbers don't exist anywhere. <laughs> you know, that is to say, you can't touch a number. It's, it's, it's an abstraction. So numbers, which certainly have all these ru weird rules attached to them, don't actually exist except in the ab in abstraction. But that became the most real of reals. That's what physicists deal with. You know, the numbers uh, related to things. Then they go look for it in the universe somewhere. Now, that is interesting. Uh, Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, was fascinated with clocks and clock time. He came up with this idea of absolute time. And absolute, uh, he said, in fact, this. Absolute, true, and mathematical time of itself, from its own nature, flows equably without regard to anything external, and by another name is called duration. That's very important. Relative, apparent, and common time is some sensible and external, whether accurate or, or unequable, measure of duration by means of motion, which is commonly used instead of true time. So he's saying that true time is duration. And our, this other stuff, which is much more flexible and kind of harder to get a grasp on, in other words, our lived-in experience of time, is not exactly true time. So that creates a problem. I would argue something almost slightly different. He said this in his uh, Philosophia uh, Naturalis uh, Principia Mathematica, if I said that at all correctly in Latin. Uh, that, uh, this was in his, his major work. So, uh, but what he's saying is this thing, this duration, what the clock measures, in other words, is true time, but then we live in some other kind of thing. And I would say this. The other kind of thing that we live in is true time. And duration is what? <laughs> it's a measurement of this thing going around, but it isn't the true time. The true time is the experience that we live in. But these definitions would eventually, you see, uh, both Galileo and uh, Newton and Descartes, the philosopher, and basically every other scientist and philosopher of the age, were influenced by this new Renaissance idea of space. And what that did was put the primary emphasis upon matter and what can be seen. So we started to see figures in a landscape, 
We started to see, see, in the Middle Ages, here's what's interesting. We, being so blind, tend to think that people in the past experienced the world the way we did. No, 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 they didn't. C.S. Lewis in The Discarded Image makes this case for the Middle Ages very completely. And Owen Barfield in his Saving the Appearances, A Study in Idolatry, also makes this case very strongly. And what the case they make is, no, people in the past did not experience the world we live in. For instance, in the Middle Ages, if you told someone there was this thing like infinity going out beyond the stars, they would all look at you like you were insane. What are you talking about? There's no such thing as infinity. They couldn't see it. They couldn't perceive it. They saw, as C.S. Lewis says in The Discarded Images, this, the discarded image, he said that they didn't experience the world as this empty space, the universe. Rather, they looked at it more like wearing a coat, that it was just something that was a part of you everywhere you went. But they didn't see, you know, like we look and we, we imagine the stars go on forever kind of thing. That's how we see it in our mind. Well, we see it in our mind because of Renaissance perspective space. The primacy of these early philosophers of, in Western society and early modern scientists was on space and weighing and measuring everything we could to understand it. So... Uh, they just happened to love weighing and measuring things. It wasn't like a bad thing. I think that uh, so m many of the good qualities of science come from this fascination with weighing and measuring things. But, the visual and the spatial began to be seen as everything. And basically this, anything that could not be weighed or measured began to be seen as less real. Now, it didn't happen all at once. It starts to happen, see, for instance, if, if what I'm saying is correct, and feel free to challenge me on this, uh, time is found in the relationships between the things themselves. Time is not found in the things. I, let me put it to you this way. If, if all there was was the visual and spatial, everything would be like a photograph and wouldn't move. In fact, there wouldn't even be the extension because it would take a while to go around and measure it. All there would be, there would be a two-dimensional space if there was no time. But time rather gives us the extension, but it also gives us the extension Oh, and then this extension, and this extension, the next one. It produces new things. For instance, uh, we have computers now. We didn't have computers 100 years ago. Where did they come from? Well, they came in time through a relationship. They started up here in someone's head looking at things, using mathematical principles and scientific principles, and needing to fulfill some relationship. So time is found in the relationships between things. But modern science began to see that, no, no, it's the atoms that are important. It's the stuff that's the most real of all. But the stuff isn't the most real of all. It's the relationships between the stuff. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. There are dialectics here. Space and time. But not only that, vision and hearing. Those are two different ways of appreciating the world. Or the image and the word. That's a, those are ways we have of relating to each other. Um, all the categories and relationships in time, because of the overemphasis on the spatial and the material and matter, all of the relationships in time started to be essentially challenged or attacked. Now, this happened about the time of what we call the Enlightenment, that these questions... See, in the 17th century, people were still... Most of the scientists of the 17th century uh, and the philosophers still held some idea of God or supreme being, being in control of the world, and then, you know, there were hierarchies floating down. But when matter began to be seen as the most real thing, eventually God became the least real thing. 
Because why? You can't weigh and measure God. You can't see God. God is not an image anywhere. And so that became a huge problem. Interestingly enough, in the Bible, God is not presented as an image. The only way you can relate to God is in time. Now, that doesn't mean God is in time, but it does mean that the only way we, humans, mortals on this planet, can relate to God is in the passage of time. Nothing in creation represents God, and this is the whole point of the Old Testament. As Owen Barfield said about, uh, you know, most of the people of the world were, in some sense, what we call a pagan tribe, They were some kind of animus. They saw the spirits in the trees. It's what what Barfield calls participation, which is an older uh, philosophical word from the, the Middle Ages where people participated in everything. But the Jews suddenly, what Barfield calls the least likeliest event in history, suddenly said God is not to be found in anything. In no image, not in animals, not in plants, not in human images. That God is not found in any of these. When God, uh, Moses asks God who he is, God doesn't go, I'm like the sun. And in fact, when the Bible says God is light, it doesn't mean God is like physically literal light. God's not, uh, you know, a waveform coming to me. God, it's, uh, or uh, T.S. Eliot has a great poem called The Invisible Light. It's God's light is not that kind of light, just any more than, for instance, it's interesting that God creates light in the first chapter of Genesis before he creates the sun. Uh, I'm not talking about this as a scientific thing. I'm talking about this as truth, that we're not meant to worship the sun because it doesn't represent God. The only thing that represents God is, in the Old Testament, it's, I am who I am. In other words, it's just his essence. And the only way you can deal with that is as a relationship of you, who you are, relating to God, who he is. Or, as it says in the first chapter of John, in the beginning was the word. The Greek word is logos. That is a word. That is an idea, but that implies a listener. It implies um, a hearer. I think that's why the Trinity is an absolutely astounding idea at this point, because it means nothing within God is static. There has always been, in a sense, a kind of communication within God, and we are now all part of that communication. But the point is this. In uh, In the beginning was a relationship. And we are part of that relationship. Again, God is not in time in any way that we can understand that. And uh, I'm not trying to boil God down to anything right here. But, but here's the thing, is that God is revealed as the word, but also as the promise. Faith, hope, love, these are central things. These are all categories exclusively a part of time. Faith, that's a relationship. You have to build faith with someone. Love. It's a relationship. You have to build love on top of your faith in someone. Uh, hope. That's about the future. In other words, these things all happen in time. So what was about to happen was something very strange here. In the Enlightenment, people like Diderot, one of the French encyclopedias, was very skeptical of about... Uh, not only the existence of God, which he didn't believe, but kind of like, what's the difference between a human being and anything else? And if you look up in the French encyclopedia, Diderot's French encyclopedia in the mid-18th century, in the 1700s, and if you look up, um, man, it says essentially there's no difference between a man, plant, animal, thing. There you have it, uh, absolute radical equality. And Owen Barfield uses the phrase identicality, 
so that we're like two school textbooks sitting next to each other, that we're the same as everything else. That is part of the battle that people are having today. Is there any uniqueness to humanity at all? Or are we all just the same? And the same as as uh, uh, the cat that was just at my window. And the same as the grape leaves that are outside uh, starting to dry up in the late uh, summer uh, skies. But here, so here's the point. God could not be weighed and measured because the emphasis was on space. So God was politely at first excluded from the discussion. And that exclusion has continued on to the present. Um, but there's an irreconcilable problem here. Either God, for instance, the things in the category of time, God, love, truth, meaning only takes place in time. Uh, words, real words only take place in time. Yes, I'm recording my words right now. I could listen to a tape recorder. I could listen to a phonograph record, to a digital recording. But they are all one step away from the uh, what the word actually is, which is not just me talking on a camera, but actually me talking to you if you were in the room and you listening and responding back. The word is not what we're saying. I mean, I've worked as a sound editor for quite a few years, and I can tell you, yes, we can look at the sound waves of words, and absolutely no, you can't understand a darn bit of meaning from those sound waves. You have to already know what the words are before you understand the meaning. There is no meaning in the sound waves because they're purely visual. The visual, Jacques Ellul in his book, The Humiliation of the Word, points this out very much. We live in a society where everything is about the image. People are trying to become an image. But the point is, it's only in the word that we can find meaning. Uh, Jacques Ellul, for instance, does something very very interesting where he divides reality from truth. Reality is the image. Is it real? Did it really happen? Yes. But the truth is the description of that. So, for instance, we could say right now, well, yes, the reality is that there are people who want to live like cats. And I am not making this up. Look up the phrase other can, look up cat kin, see if I'm talking out of my, uh, nether regions or not. I am not. There are people who want to live like cats. So, yes, there are people who dress like cats, act like cats, get surgical implants to be like cats. So the reality is there are people who want to live like cats. But what's the truth of that reality? Should people live like cats? See, in the realm of truth, there is also the realm of untruth. And what happens is, as when we politely kick God out the door, we kind of optimistically thought, and Rookmacher really makes this point, we optimistically thought, all that other stuff will stay. Meaning, love, truth, beauty, it's all going to stay. We just kind of politely push God out of the way because you can't measure him. Well, you can't measure truth, and you can't measure love, and you can't measure peace, and you can't measure joy, and you can't measure love, uh, you can't measure hope, and you can't measure our words. That's the most important thing. Without our words, there is no meaning. What do these words mean? The words that we are speaking, are they just sociological symbols? Are they just, uh, uh, that is to say, or are they just biological symbols? Is that all they are? If they are, then nothing means anything, except it's all just pushing on pedals like lab rats trying to get our needs met. Although, what is the need for self-destruction that people have that they keep pressing on that pedal to get? Well, I'll tell you, it's an absence of meaning because in a world where all that matters is what you can weigh and measure, then everything becomes relative because you've, you've only left... The things that are objective are completely... Well, it's numbers. All the rest of it is subjective. <laughs> you know, that's what you come down to. So that's why my feeling is people have gone insane. 
is because they've actually listened to, a, and it's not really the good scientists as much as it is the popularizations of science, the implications that get people get about science that, you know, I mean, there was some article in Newsweek magazine back in the 1990s that said the gay gene, and then people have been saying, yes, it's, it's like this, it's like this. It, it sticks in your head, even if we now know there's no such animal. And we do. There was a recent article about a week ago that said exactly that. There's no such animal. But people take the popularized version of science that they will read in some sort of, nowadays they'll just read it on a blog and who knows what's behind that. And they'll think that's the truth, except of course they no longer believe in truth, which is really funny. The irreconcilable problem is this. Either God, love, truth, meaning, the word, Faith, hope, beauty, human nature itself are all categories in time. Either these don't exist, these are just purely illusions that we have fabricated, along with the illusion of time itself, as we'll come to in a minute. And, or these things are just being completely attacked and made to seem irrational and irrelevant. I would opt for the second, that these things are being attacked. And why? That's a long, que that's a deep question. And I'll try to answer that maybe next time. But the point is this, they do exist. Beauty, faith, hope, joy, peace, love, all of these qualities do exist. Love isn't just the libido. Love isn't just altruism whatever that means. Love is something much deeper. We know it when we see it. It's hard to define. It is a relationship in time. And I will discuss that more next week. But interestingly, deep physics has been discovering more about time since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it is often still space time, more than space-time. That is to say, space is still the bigger element. So I, when Einstein talks about the curvature of space-time, we're still imagining this thing stretching on and then kind of seeing this weird relationship in time. But it, uh, Einstein said something that I think is interesting in relationship to his ideas about time. And he said this, the distinction between the past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Now he was talking about physics because he understood very clearly this idea doesn't work in everyday life. Um, again, he said something very interesting. He said, the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. What does that mean? Well, I think what it is, is he's kind of giving the game away. He's saying, well, you know, everything doesn't happen at once, so therefore there must be time. And that's kind of getting to a deep level principle. In a more joking way, uh, Einstein is reported by one of his secretaries as saying the following. When you sit with a nice girl for two hours, you think it's only a minute. But when you sit on a hot stove for a minute, you think it's two hours. That's relativity. Which I think is pretty funny, because that's our lived experience. Now, like I said, uh, Einstein could not reconcile uh, what he had discovered about time in the greater universe with our lived experience of time. And I think this gets back to the problem of what is the ultimate reality. Is the ultimate reality numbers? Because that is the final conclusion. And the physicist deals with numbers more than anything. They are not quite just simply mathematic mathematicians, but nevertheless, numbers are their tools. And then it's up to astronomers and other people to go find these things in the universe that they discover through numbers. But, Nevertheless, our lived experience of time is something radically different than that. And how do you reconcile those two things? Werner Heisenberg said an interesting thing. 
And he's the person who came up with the idea of the uncertainty principle. Um, and he said, it is seen that both matter and radiation possess a remarkable duality of character, as they sometimes exhibit the properties of waves and at other times those of particles. Now, it is obvious that a thing cannot be a form of wave motion and composed of particles at the same time. The two concepts are too different. And Heisenberg, he's also the person who says you can't really find where a subatomic particle is at the same time you can find it moving. That is to say, you can't trace its movement at the same time you locate it. It's a very strange kind of thing. And you, certainly what happens is if you do, then you change the results, which is the, a very interesting thing that I do think has some kind of application back to the real world. For instance, the very fact that I am filming this with a camera right now means it's changing the presentation that I would give if you were actually sitting in the room. I would not be talking like this. But he was talking on a more profound level of physical science. And what he's saying here is essentially, how can these things have both waves and be a particle? And they can both be these things. And it's just like, uh, you know, it's a bit much, but it becomes very important to our thinking in just a moment uh, related to time. Stephen Hawking, Hawking. Stephen Hawking is often uh, associated with the phrase the arrow of time and talks about black holes as time-eating singularities in the universe. And my feeling that he is often stuck again in Galileo's number category. And thus, like Einstein, he is unable to resolve the difference between the mathematical model of time an observable experience. And I think they have to eventually be resolved, which they aren't at all yet. Yet chaos theory, and uh, I believe Richard Feynman was one of the people who kind of started leading towards the idea of chaos theory. Um, chaos theory has some interesting doors to open to allow time to breathe again. One of them is the fact that no two things, for instance, there are clouds, there is water, there is land, and these things are somehow different, and yet no two clouds are alike. Uh, if you watch the water at a waterfall, it is never exactly the same twice going over the, the, the pattern of it, uh, any more than dirt is the same in one patch and another. So now, just as Einstein, when he produced his relativity theory, did not mean that everything was relativistic. Uh, we often put these things in our kind of uh, modern jargon slang, like Einstein was talking about, yeah, morals are just relative. Einstein would have said, what are you talking about? I'm not talking about that. He was talking about the physical properties of the universe and something else related to light speed. Uh, just as chaos theory does not mean everything's chaos, what it means is that there are things in our environment too complex to understand, and there always will be. We will never. Uh, the physicist, the French physicist Laplace said, if we will know the uh, position of, and, and the, the, the position and movement of everything in the universe, something like this, we could know everything that's going to happen. And Stephen Hawking is close to saying similar things. But then again, these do not match with anything that is observable in our experience uh, lived. And this becomes very important. But chaos theory says things that, you know, these little differences are everything. It also means that, for instance, two people cannot stand in the same place at the same time. And this goes back to what Heisenberg was saying about this this whole thing of a wave and a, and a particle and how you know, how do you resolve these things? They, they, they both have the same properties, yet they're different. And what does that mean? Well, what I mean by saying that you can't stand in the same place at the same time means that even, for instance, there's no way to switch places quick enough. That's, that's clear. 
But even if you could, that is say, even if I could will myself instantaneously to be in another person's shoes and look out of it from their eyes, I could never see the same thing. Part of it is I would need all their memories as well. And, uh, and for instance, by the time I move, well, you know, there's that whole thing of when you walk into a river, you're never walking in the same place twice. There's not the same river. It's moving. But that's actually everything in the world. That's uh, some of the basic uh, principles of chaos theory, is that things are so complex that we can never understand it all, but nor can we, you know, that, that they're going to keep moving. Uh, so that this brings a uniqueness back to everything, and the uniqueness then goes into our conceptions of how we look at everything. See, the, the mechanistic view of time based on spatial relationships would say that <clears throat> if I take a slide of your blood and if I look at it in a microscope, I will see that uh, different kinds of, you know, uh, biological uh, properties within it, cells and, and fluid and things like this, and that this will tell me something that I can generalize into the nature of blood. Well, up to a point, you can. But the truth is, no two slides of blood would have the same things in it. And certainly not from two different people. Uh, because that's how complex things are. And science has not taken into account the complexity yet. And we are still waiting for that to happen. More and more, the physicists are beginning to understand the complex nature of reality and time. And yet that understanding has not trickled down yet to the other sciences. Uh, I think, you know, maybe into chemistry, maybe into uh, other fields closely related to physis physics. But biology is still operating under mechanistic principles. Uh, and I think this, you feel this when you walk into a modern hospital and the way you're treated is like one shot works for all. And then people get upset when it doesn't because the truth is everything is so complicated. And we haven't, we don't have a science yet that's general. And we certainly don't have a popular understanding of this that makes sense of our science. Now, there have been people who have questioned science and they tend to immediately go back to superstition. And that's not what I'm talking about. What we need is a science to be reinterpreted using a true time perspective, putting, adding a true time perspective back into it, uh, rather than just duration. In other words, time can't be seen as just the duration on the clock, that one time fits all. Yes, there is duration, but time isn't the duration. I think it's just exactly the opposite. True time is always personal for everything because everything is a relationship. When we've gotten down to the smallest subatomic particles, the quarks and gluons and things, the amazing thing is how much space there is in there and what holds everything together. The fact is it's a relationship. The miracle, the mystery isn't that there are things. The mystery is that somehow these things are in relationship to produce solidity. That's where the, uh, the, the difficult part comes in. And that these things are producing... Um, it's interesting, in information theory, there's an idea that started to be formulated by the idea it from bit. Bit is the smallest amount of information. But it is the thing. So the particle, the, the subatomic particle, the cell, DNA. But the point is this. What is DNA? It's a lot of bits of information. And what is the atom? It's a lot of bits of information. So... What comes first? The particle? The, the energy? The radiation? The waveform? Or the information? Guess what? Information's there first.
if the universe started with a big bang, whether God started that or not, depending on how you look at it, somehow there was a lot of information in there. Hmm. So what that means is, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What would a science look like that reincorporated a time perspective into it? I mean, a real-time perspective, not just uh, the fantastic level of, of detail that we can get through measuring through, say, nanoseconds or something like that. But what if we were to actually bring back the, the serious complexity uh, and uniqueness of all things through time? What would a science look like through that? Well, first of all, when you went to mathematics, yeah, mathematics would still be super important, obviously. All, all the sciences we have learned are, you know, they, they are there. They're good. Uh, it's our interpretation of things is where things go nuts. And I would say this, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Still true. But it's still abstract. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Yes, there it is out there. How wonderful. 2 plus 2 equals 4. An eternal law? Nah, it's just a fact. But here's the point. Once you incorporate time back into a scientific understanding of the world, it's not just 2 plus 2 equals 4. Those are principles. It's 2 apples plus 2 apples equal 4 apples. And then the question is, for how long? What will you find if you come back in a year? Will all the apples be gone? Will some of them be half eaten and dried? Will seeds start to sprout and produce a new tree, which will then produce who knows how many apples? We don't know. Depends on where you leave the apples. If you leave them in your refrigerator, you get one thing. If you leave them in, in uh, a desert, you'll get another. If you leave them on the soil that apples like, you'll get something very different. If you leave them among friends, who knows what they'll be like when you get back there. So, science needs to reincorporate time in order to understand the meaning of things. And we are very far away from doing that. And if that, what I'm saying sounds like the ramblings of someone who knows nothing about science, because you know about science, well, just think about what I'm saying and ask, has science arrived at any point we could consider a final destination yet? No. Why not? Maybe what I'm saying has something to do with it. Maybe that difference between the fantastic cosmological significance of the works of Einstein and Hawking and others needs to be somehow reconciled with observable experience. Maybe we need to find a way to rescue the secondary properties and bring them back, what Owen Barfield calls final participation from the idolatry of matter in the material world. Maybe we need to bring them back into life so that we understand them in a proper way. I'm not saying I know how to do that. I am not a scientist. I am I'm just simply presenting these are thoughts that I've had. And I'm not done yet. I've got more on time to come. Next week, we're going to start talking about some practical things. But it really comes down to, I think, the, the one I'm waiting to get to is the one on time and evil. Time and love. Those ones. I'm not even going to give you much of a preview on that. All, all I can say is, you want to come back for that. That's where the rubber meets the road. Anyway, who knows how long I've rambled doing this. Um, I'm grateful that you've been here. I've been listening to the construction most of the time I've been here. Cats have been jumping around outside on, on the balconies next door to me. I've enjoyed being here, so thanks for coming. And, hey, I could really use, uh, if you want uh, uh, your support, first of all, subscribe, like this thing, smite like, just do it. But if you want to uh, provide a little uh, financial sustenance uh, through, you know, the products of your own time and labor, I would really appreciate that. You can do it through PayPal. And if you do it for at least $10 a month, then you can get uh, at least 15 hours right now. I've got ready to go of extra content. There will be lots more coming down the road. 
And um, this will be stuff you can only get through uh, on the other side of the paywall, and it'll be stuff full of copyrighted material that I can't put online. So uh, I've got one, History of San Francisco in the 1960s, that's ready to go right now, the Extended Noise Lecture. So, or you can also get it with a one-time donation of $50 or more. So think about that. Okay, enough trying to sell you something. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. And, you know, anadromous, as I've said before, means swimming against the stream. That's all I'm trying to do here. I don't know how successfully, but you need to think about how you can go against the stream of this modern technological world where there is no meaning in anything because everything is just seen as matter. And in the end, it's all about your drives and desires and your whole definition of yourself. It's just however you de define yourself where that cannot be true. There is something which is true. So I'll see you later. Swim against the stream. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments. First time I like the odd. If I ever run into any of you bums on a street corner, just let's pretend we never met before.